Thank you everyone for joining us for this pro-life presentation and a special greetings to everyone who is joining us via live, live stream. Um, my name is Claire Ruff and I serve as the director of events and outreach for a pro-life organization called the Hosea Initiative. We're based in uh, Northern Virginia and so we would like to start with a prayer. Monsignor, can you lead us in an opening prayer? Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your church, which brings us to new life in you through the sacraments. We ask you, Lord, to bless all efforts to promote life in the world, both spiritually and, of course, physically. We ask you, Lord, to bless all those who are engaged in the effort of protecting life from conception until natural death. Uh, bless the work of uh, Hosea and all who are committed to it. And we pray that uh, we will joyfully assist those who are in, in most need of our assistance. Uh, we ask all of this through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Claire. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm just going to get my little camera, my, I mean, my little timer going here so I'm mindful. Well, today we're going to be talking about fathers and abortion. And I'll be unpacking the life and legacy of a man who was called the father of the abortion industry in the United States, Bernard Nathanson. His role in founding the industry as it is today and his amazing conversion from chief abortionist to pro-life activist. After my presentation, then Dr. Charlie Peters is going to explore the role of fathers in protecting life and how essential it is that we have men engaged in this battle against abortion. But before we dig in, I just wanted to pause for a moment so that we can honor a great pro-life hero, Joseph Scheidler. He passed away just Wednesday of last week on January 18th at the age of 93. But he was a, a fighter to the end against the tyranny of abortion. He was a full-time pro-life activist from just after Roe v. Wade. And he earned the title of father of pro-life activism. He and his wife Ann in 1980 started the Pro-Life Action League and it was, it was hubbed in his hometown of Chicago. So he had produced videos on sidewalk counseling. Um, he, he had a special video called Meet the Abortion Providers and it gave an inside eyewitness look at the abortion industry from those who had actually left it. Joe also wrote a couple of books. One was called Closed, 99 Ways to End Abortion. And then his autobiography called Racketeer for Life. And it's kind of a clever title, but it was spun from a 20 year litigation suit that was brought against him for racketeering of all things. It was uh, now the National Organization of Women brought this lawsuit against him. And he went to the Supreme Court two times, won both times, but it really it consumed so many years, over 20 years of his life. He was referred to, I think, re because of this, as the godfather of the pro-life movement. And we have a slide that, that we can show of an image of of Joe in his signature fedora hat, so maybe that was also part of it. But he will be deeply missed by the pro-life community. And our prayers embrace Anne and their seven children and 26 grandchildren. As a devout Catholic, he fought valiantly for the spiritual battle for life. And I can only imagine 
the heavenly reward that's, re that's waiting for him for being such a lion-hearted warrior. Let's just say a quick prayer for his soul. Lord, may the, his soul and the soul of, of all the faithful departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. You can also find out more information about Joe and the Pro-Life Action League at their website, prolifeactionleague.org. So now we're going to shift our focus um, from the pro-life, the father of pro-life activism, or some have called him the father of the pro-life movement, and Joe Scheidler, to the main character and the point of our attention today who is the father of the abortion industry. So we have a slide that's up right now, and it's an image of a man. I just wonder if you're even familiar with him or you've heard his name. Our experience at the Hosea Initiative is that 95% of those who attend our conferences or presentations have never even heard of him. His name? Bernard Nathanson, and his story and compelling, compelling conversion, we hope will equip you with a special confidence to be able to talk about this current and hot topic in today's society. There is a great divide in our country, and we need now more than ever for people to be informed with the facts and the truth so they can strongly defend the pro-life position. And that's my hope today, and uh, combined with Dr. Charlie, that we will give you some tools, the verbiage and words that you can share with others in your, your circle of influence. We will cut through some of the lies and deception that's been easily prop propagated and at the end of my presentation, and again at the very end of this uh, talk, we'll have a slide up with our website, hosea4u.org, and my email. So if you want to, you can reach out to me personally. I'd love to hear from you. So this topic of abortion and fathers prompted me to include a part of, of Dr. Nathanson's story that isn't always covered in our conferences, lectures. I wanted to focus just a little bit as a prelude into his life on the men in Dr. Nathanson's world, his father and grandfather in particular, those who influenced his young life. So let's, let's jump back a few generations and start with Dr. Nathanson's grandpa. His grandfather was a hard-working lumberjack in Canada. And he, in a lumbering accident, um, he damaged his lungs and he contracted tuberculosis. And this was a terrific sadness for the family. In an attempt to save his life, they sacrificed everything that they had and sent him to a sanatorium in Colorado. Well, months pass and more, and he's not getting well. And he receives a letter from a relative that says, basically accusing him of being selfish and saying, aren't you aware that your family is starving at home? Well, tragically, you may imagine what he thought was the best solution was to take his own life thinking that this would be the greatest gift to his starving family. Of course, it was not. It only compounded their problems and added immeasurable grief. His poor widow could only see one path forward, and that was to remarry in order to save her family. So she accepted an offer from a widower in Ottawa, Canada, who was the acting Jewish leader so just imagine that in those days there really weren't there there weren't rabbis for every nucleus of a Jewish community in Canada, 
And he was delegated to be the one who ritually slaughtered the kosher meats and most especially the sacrificial lambs at Passover. So he was well respected, a good man, but he himself was a widower who had five children and he couldn't support them all. So he told Nathanson's grandmother that in the contract of marriage, he would allow for her to bring one of her five children into the union. Can you imagine that? The sacrifice of this mother who had to decide which of her children could come with her. The older children she, she positioned in homes of relatives and even into an orphanage for a few. And then littlest and youngest Joseph, Nathanson's father, was the child that she brought with her to Ottawa. Now, little Joseph Nathanson, he was very smart. And he was smarter than all of his step-siblings. And it was quickly decided by his stepfather that he would be the one to follow the track in the rabbinic training. He was going to be a rabbi. And the only problem to this is that he didn't want to be a rabbi. He wanted to be a doctor. So after some time of trying and, and just the stepfather could see that this really wasn't working out, he had no interest in being a rabbi. He said that he could go on and become a doctor if he wanted to, but he wasn't going to support him financially. And that was a terrific hardship. Dr. Nathanson's father got through medical school, but basically by living on bread and water most of the time, it was a result of his small stature and his severe malnourishment that even brought the board at the school, the medical school, to consider dismissing him permanently because his iron levels were so low. But he was one of their top students. So kind of a bright light in this whole sad story is that a kindly professor sees what's happening behind the scenes and he invites Joey over to have dinner with them every Friday night. And of course, Friday night was for the Jewish community. This was their Shabbat. It was, it was their uh, welcoming in of the Sabbath. And they filled him with meats and potatoes and liver and lots of good things and sent him home with little goodie bags so that he'd have a couple more dinners through the week. And sure enough, his health improves. He graduates from med school, but not only graduates, he finishes second in the whole class. And about this time, Nathanson's dad meets his mom, his mother. And she was a few years older. She had been kind of written off as a spinster at age 28. But they arranged a match and drew up a marriage contract. And Nathanson's dad, newly out of, of, of medical school, is thinking, whoa, the dowry could go towards my additional medical training and setting up a new practice. So the wedding day arrives. And the father of the bride doesn't keep his word. He reneges on the contract. He shows up and he doesn't have the dowry. And the embarrassed bride, Nathanson's mom, is just pleading with her, her groom, and saying, please don't embarrass us. Everyone's here. Can we just go through with the wedding? And then I promise you, you have my word, my father will come through with the dowry. Well, in short, he didn't, not the next day, not the next month, not for years. And this, this contention and lack of, of trust in each other became so contentious that Nathanson would describe their union as a loveless marriage. And on to this stage, we welcome in the two children of this union, the oldest, Bernard Nathanson, and his younger sister. 
Now, Nathan sends dad make sure that he attends the best grammar schools. They were 100% attended by Jewish students, but interestingly, they had Gentiles for some of their instructors. And interestingly, like he, Nathan's in his autobiography says that they, they would sing, sometimes they'd sing Christmas songs at, at the Christmas time. So in, in, this is interesting and it's important because later, um, this introduction, this sort of soft and gentle and welcoming positive exposure to Christianity comes into play later in Nathanson's life. But after he would go to grammar school, then he would go to a Hebrew school three nights a week. And there he would learn this Old Testament readings and prepare for his bar mitzvah. But this is an interesting detail that I, I wanted to share, that when he came home, his father would then grill him on what he had just learned at school, at Hebrew school, the, the Torah and the Talmud. And, and the only way I can think of this in the most positive light is that his dad was maybe using what is culturally a way that rabbis will interrogate each other and they practice on sort of tearing apart the minutiae of the law and this is kind of what they do. But to a young boy whose faith was just budding and forming, all of this criticism had one outcome. It shredded any, any hope of faith that was growing in the young boy. And Nathanson said that after his bar mitzvah, he never walked one day into another synagogue, not one foot into a synagogue after his bar mitzvah. And it would be decades before he would ever enter into a, a house of worship. Well, he goes on to college and he is very intelligent. He finishes a four-year college degree in two years. He goes through summers and holidays, and at age 19, he enters medical school in Montreal, following in the footsteps of his father. There he meets a lovely young freshman lady named Ruth, and they quickly form an attachment and fall in love, and they're deeply enamored with each other. Their relationship blossoms for three years and they talk of marriage. Now they're in their last and final year of school and in February, Ruth has missed three periods. And Nathanson seeks advice from his father. He goes to his father to find direction. His dad was an, an obstetrician and gynecologist in New York at this time, and he wanted to know what should he do. So his father confirms the pregnancy with a lab test, and then he sends him $500 in an envelope and advises him to find an abortionist. And if he can't find one, then, then he should take Ruth across the border and marry her. Well, Nathanson does locate through some other friends, he locates someone who is an MD who would be willing to perform the abortion. And he sends Ruth carrying their 14 week old child in a taxi with the money in her clutch, in her purse. And he sits on the steps of the library and waits. He waits long beyond their rendezvous point, four, year, four hours beyond. And at the strike, he said he heard the clock striking eight o'clock. And the taxi pulls up and out comes the ashen figure of young Ruth, covered in blood hemorrhaging from a botched abortion. And he holds her and they sit on the steps in the evening twilight. And is his autobiography, he says, 51 years later, and I still remember it as if it were yesterday. 
And he said, all I could think was she must have been thinking in her mind, didn't he love me enough to marry me? Why wouldn't he let me have our baby? But they never talk about it. And this cherished relationship quickly moves to distrust, separation, and then completely dissolves months, only months later. And Nathanson said this served as my introductory excursion into the satanic world of abortion. He graduates from medical school and in, he say, in, in professing the Hippocratic Oath, in that year of 1949, as a result of the World War II horrific scientific experiments, I find this very interesting, that their Hippocratic Oath had an additional sentence added by the World Medical Association, and here's what it was. And Nathanson recited this. I will retain the utmost respect for human life from conception. That was part of his Hippocratic Oath. Now, just 15 years later, in 1964, the World Medical Association will alter this, and they will change the sentence to read, the health of my patient is my primary consideration. Mm, very different. Well, Nathanson's OBGYN practice flourishes. He's one of the most respected and, uh, doctors in New York City, and his practice grows, and in, that's fast forward now, about 20 years, to a very key moment in July of 1967 at a dinner party where he meets a man named Lawrence Later. They were both guests at this party, and Larry uh, later makes a point to sit right next to Nathanson. He had one topic on his mind, the same as the title of his most recent book, Abortion. He was ready to launch a revolution of sexual freedom, but he needed a medical expert, and Nathanson was his man. And they go on to form the National Association for the Repeal of Abortion Laws. We have a slide here for you to see. It's called NARAL, and you'll hear that in a lot. Today, it's actually referred to as NARAL Pro-Choice America, but it goes back to this beginning with the father of the abortion industry as co-founder. So when you hear that in today's or read it in articles, you're gonna know what it was. This was the first ever attempt at organizing, officially organizing, a, a pro-abortion effort in the United States. And they were able, in just one presidential cycle, in four and a half years, to overturn the laws in our country. They set their sights first on their home state of New York. Easy, 1970, it was done. Their lobbying efforts were successful, and they had the state legislative, um, the laws were passed, and Governor Rockefeller signed them, 1970. And then they set up the abortion centers in New York. They recruited Margaret Sanger, you've heard her name probably, to join the movement. But you may not have known that Nathanson and Lairder were the ones who pulled her in. Actually, she didn't want to have anything to do with it. Planned Parenthood is on record in the 1950s as saying that abortion was not good for women. But Nathanson shows her the money, and then she changes her mind, and, Nath and Nayral influences the name change of her organization to Planned Parenthood. Dr. Nathanson trains the abortionists for these centers. He trains the nurses. He even trains the administrative staff. He sets everything up. He says that if, if it weren't for him, the entire experiment of the abortion industry would have collapsed in nine months because of failed health inspections. 
and just kind of an important aside here, I don't know if you are remembering from the news, but just a few years back in fall of 2018, the state of Missouri had six abortion centers close out of the seven. They only had seven. Six of them closed, and the reason wasn't because of failed legis uh, because of pro-life legislation. It's because they failed to pass their inspection, their health inspection. So I want I, I would like to propose to you that against the messaging of today's culture that abortion is safe and sterile, that you think in your mind and you plant these words, abortion is dirty and dangerous for women. Don't be fooled. That is much truer to the facts. Well, the Roe v. Wade decision comes in 1973, again, just within one four-year presidential election cycle, and it was momentous. But what most people don't know is just a few months later, this man who initiated the entire industry, now head of obstetrics at St. Luke's Hospital, one of the largest hospitals in New York City, he had a new technology demonstrated to him, and it was real-time ultrasound. Now, ultrasound was developed after World War II, and maybe this is, this is probably one of the good things that happened in World War II, because the government had to pour lots of research time and, and dollars into detecting a way to discover the U-boats, the, the, the German submarines, underwater. And as a result of that Doppler radar technology, they were able to to see through the amniotic fluid and be able to see a clear image of the child growing in his or her mother's womb. And Nathanson is there in his office, and this technician is demonstrating an, a brand new equipment and scientific invention, and they're rubbing the gel over the mother's belly and he sees a little 16-week-old baby girl. She's wiggling her toes and sucking her thumb. And then she must have been tickled by the wand or the jelly or something because then she kind of rolled over right into the camera and smiled. And he says that at that moment, it was like scales came off of his eyes. He said, like Paul on the way to Damascus, he was struck. Now what he sees in that moment is the Holocaust. So as raised from a Jewish home, he actually had relatives who, were, who, who he lost, relatives who died in the concentration camps. But he said, they took away, the Nazis took away the personhood in order to justify the slaughter of the millions. And now I am the perpetrator. And that day he stopped. He stopped doing abortions. Imagine the impact of this. This is a man who had 75,000 abortions on his soul. He had personally performed 5,000, one on his own child. 10,000, he participated by training the other abortionists in the early industry. And 60,000 that were done under his direct supervision as director of the largest abortion center at that time in the US, in New York City. It was probably the largest in the world. And New York had become the epicenter. In a, the next few years, he did perform a few abortions, rarely, I, I need to say that, um, on some rare cases. But by 1975, he had said, it, there's, no, there's no excuse, there's no rationale for abortion, in, for anything, in any case. And he had been trying in these two years to influence NARAL, persuade them with this moral dilemma, but they wouldn't budge. 
In fact, we, we have minutes from the NARAL, the board meetings, and, and they said, we, we, we know it's a child. Basically, they, they didn't care. And they were more concerned how embarrassed they were as, as, as medical doctors at the number of three, third trimester saline abortion children that were actually being born alive. They were more embarrassed about that. So Nathanson decides that there's no hope. He can't convert them, he can't, he can't convince them, and he just has to wipe his hands for the whole thing. And he decides to resign. The original of his resignation letter was given to us by his widow to Jose Initiative, and we have it. <clears throat> and there's a sentence in here that I think is really, really telling. He writes, but what if we've been wrong? If the court, the Supreme Court, should soon reverse itself on the abortion issue in light of changing times and or new scientific evidence, what an incalculable injustice we will have perpetrated. What an immeasurable, irretrievable loss we will have been suffered. The annual dues are $10 a year and the hubris, the arrogance of certainty. And I no longer can afford those dues sincerely. Bernard Nathanson, MD. So he leaves NARAL. The abortionists aren't going to talk to him. Those who supported life and were anti-abortionists, they didn't trust him. He was all alone in this ethical di di dilemma, and he said he didn't have a seedling of faith to guide him. He now had, he now had this horrible uh, issue of, of realizing what he had done and the magnitude of what he had just done, but he had no he had no way to get out of it. I think that sometimes we forget what a luxury we have as Catholics, especially in the Sacrament of Reconciliation. Just imagine if there wasn't such a thing, and that was the world of Dr. Nathanson. He had the burden of seeing that he had sinned grievously, and he had no way to resolve it. He only thought that of himself as such a monster that no one could love him, and he should take his own life because he didn't deserve to live. So he suffered a decade of darkness, he called it, where he felt suicidal. But many people must have been praying for this amazing breakthrough, and it's perhaps the greatest conversion story of modern history. That after this decade of darkness, an Opus Dei priest crossed paths with him, and he listens. And he lets Nathanson unburden his soul and guides him step by step, little by little, towards the truth until he walks him right to the foot of the cross. And Nathanson calls him one day and says, Father McClowski, I'm ready. So Father knew what that meant. He was ready to be baptized. And he was baptized on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, December the 8th, 1996, in St. Patrick's Cathedral by Cardinal O'Connor. And I've been to the little catacombs chapel, the day chapel and the catacombs underneath in the sort of the cellar of St. Patrick's. And that's where he received the waters of new birth. Nathanson had a card prepared that he handed out to all the guests who attended, and it read, God is rich in mercy. There's nothing that can't be forgiven if we humble ourselves before the living God. And I think that should fill us all with great hope. We should tell this story to others who may be struggling post-abortion regrets or, or even those who have thoughts of suicide because they lack any hope. We have hope through the mercy of God. 
And that's one of the things that a Jose Initiative likes to bring to all of our presentations. So our story kind of wraps up with maybe how I personally get involved with it. Um, my boss was uh, Terry Beatley, was at a women's all-night prayer vigil. And in her prayer, she was asking the Lord what else she could do to help end abortion. And she says that in her thoughts or her heart or her prayer, she understands or hears this voice that says, go and interview Dr. Bernard Nathanson. And she's wondering, like, did I get that right? And she kind of questions it for a little while, but it's persistent and it comes back over the next weeks. And at a certain point, she knew that not to obey it would be displeasing to God. And so she thought, well, I'll probably fail, but <clears throat> I'm going to try. She didn't know where he was or how to track him down, but she, she does. And she gets a phone number and calls their Manhattan home. And Nathanson's wife answers, Adele, and listens to Terry's appeal. His wife explains that Nathanson had not done an interview in over a year that he had terminal cancer, and they didn't know how long he would even live. But she suggests that Terry write her request and fax it, and then she would ask the doctor, as she called her husband. So surprisingly, a few days later, she gets a call, and she said, he wants to see you. I'm, I'm kind of surprised, but he wants to talk with you. Can you come on December the 1st? And she flew to New York City, and she sat beside him, weak from illness. The man who initiated the entire industry of abortion. And he told her the way that NARAL flipped the laws in the country by eight propaganda strategies. They crafted the slogans. They framed the argument around choice, which was a brilliant thing. I tell you, he was a brilliant man. They used the media. They, they groomed them to, to, to spread their lies. And of course, the media, thinking he was an expert, they never questioned anything about his, his integrity or his facts, they made up the facts. He just took them, he told Terry, he just made them up and took them out of thin air. He lied about the number of abortions done per year, gravely exaggerated the number of women. He said 10,000 women a year are dying from botched abortions. And the reality was anywhere in the, in the range of like 60 to, to about 200, and that's, that's too many, but it wasn't, it was gravely, um, grossly over overdone. They made up the polling statistics and then they repeated the lies again and again and again until it became common knowledge. And we're all living by those slogans and, and that propaganda. But the thing that surprised me was the eighth point of propaganda. And we, we cover it in these little fact check booklets little $3 booklets that Jose has put together. The eighth point surprised me, and it was called, they named it, the Catholic strategy. It was their focus and their intention to take down the Catholic Church, especially the hierarchy, by maligning them. And they had a whole strategy of how they were going to do this, but they wanted to put a separation between the people and the, the teaching authority of the church because they, that was their number one nemesis. It was really an all-out war on religion, first and foremost. And, and Nathanson, in his book, Aborting America, talks about this in great detail and repeats this over and over again. The underlying, the foundation of the abortion movement was a war on the Catholic Church. Well, I can't go more into those than our conferences. We actually spend entire hours on those points, on the Catholic strategy and as well on these eight points. So you can find out more information about us. But I'd like to finish with the ending. As that interview ended, Dr. Nathanson was getting really too weak to go on. And Terry asked if he had a message 
and she promised that she would bring it to the people. And he told her in a rather weak voice, yes, yes I do. Teach the strategy of how I deceived America and tell them the co-founder of NARAL says, love one another. Abortion is not love. Stop the killing. The world needs love, and I'm all about love now. And Terry left him, and basically that was the, the genesis or the beginning of our organization of the Jose Initiative. You'll see online, you can see where you can find us on our website, Hosea, the number four u.org, and my information so you can get in touch with me. Um, thank you so much for your attention. Now, if you hold on, because we have some really good thoughts from Dr. Charlie Peters, um, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about fathers and abortion from his perspective as a pediatrician. Um, and then we will take at the very end, we'll take a few questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claire, for your very kind invitation and allowing me to address the audience this afternoon about the role of fathers in abortion. But first, briefly, a little bit about myself. My wife, Jennifer, and I have been married for over 38 years, and I have been members of the Cathedral Parish since 2012. I'm a physician who trained in pediatrics and pediatric blood and cancer. I am the immediate past Grand Knight of the La Crosse Council of the Knights of Columbus. I am not, however, a father. My wife, a nurse, and I would have gladly welcomed children, but we were not blessed by God in this way. Instead, we were given the true privilege of caring for three of our parents in their complex, chronic, and ultimately fatal illnesses, which led to all three of them passing within a period of about 18 months. But in the past eight years, working as a general pediatrician, I have had the privilege, and yes, the great pleasure, even at all hours of the day and night, to attend countless births. For most of them, the father of the baby was present. As I recall, moms were always there. <laughs> I witnessed firsthand the joy of these parents at the birth of their child. In many instances, their first happy birthday. I have also been the physician who circumcised infant boys when parents requested it. Over the years, I can recall only two fathers asking to attend their son's circumcision. I agreed but absolutely insisted that they sit while I performed it. And mind you, Joseph, St. Joseph, either performed or watched his own son's circ. I have spent most of my 38-year medical career taking care of other people's children with very serious and potentially fatal diseases. I have witnessed firsthand the heartbreak of a father upon learning from me that his son or daughter had leukemia or a metastatic tumor or a rare neurologic disorder that could only be cured by a bone marrow transplant. I shared the gut-wrenching grief of a father after being told by me that our medical team no longer had any curative options or treatments to offer his child. Finally, I have watched and waited with the heart of a father at the bedside 
with that father as his child died. I have attended more births and deaths of children than any father of a family. These are the children that God has asked me to protect and provide healing to the best of my ability. In a sense, a spiritual fatherhood. As tragic as these stories were and are, there was something even more heartbreaking that I encountered during my career. Hospitals covering up preventable deaths to avoid lawsuits, and physicians euthanizing critically ill children with impunity. I could not and did not accept or tolerate such unconscionable abominations. It has been said that the surest way for evil to flourish is for good men to do nothing. Tolerance of evil is not a Christian value. But raising one's voice is often not well received. And this so-called disruptive behavior can have serious consequences. But I will move on. As a fourth degree member of the Knights of Columbus and its honor guard, I can share with you that the Knights are deeply committed to a culture of life in which all life is cherished and afforded the dignity it deserves from the moment of conception until the last natural breath. Since its inception in 1882, the Knights of Columbus, founded by blessed Michael J. McGivney, has stood as the strong right arm of the church and continues to challenge men from all walks of life to grow in their faith through its programs, fraternity, and a variety of printed and video resources. As Catholic men, we are called to do more, and the Knights of Columbus can help a man answer this call to live out an active faith. What are some examples of how Knights do this? Well, there are four major areas, faith, family, community, and life, and I'd like to focus just briefly on some of the life programs. Marches for Life. Over the decades, Knights have been clearly visible at these events, and now with more of them becoming virtual, we are reaching out in other ways. For example, through Lifesavers for Life campaign that we held here at the cathedral earlier in the month, and even today's presentation on fathers and abortion. Our ultrasound initiative. You just heard from Claire how powerful the image of the baby in the mother's womb can be. It truly is a game changer and provides compelling, visible medical evidence that a developing human being is living in the mother's uterus. By the way, the Knights have sponsored more than 1,200 ultrasound machines throughout the U.S. And as Dr. Nathanson said, if there were more windows into the womb, there wouldn't be abortion. This medical invention is such a window into the womb. Pregnancy care centers, we support them because every woman deserves to know that she has the support she needs during this time in her life and that she actually does receive it. And then we are also called to be men and women of prayer. And so we often will lead novenas for life.
Today, in 2021, in this year of St. Joseph, as declared by our Holy Father, Pope Francis, and prior declared by our own Bishop Callahan, you might be surprised, maybe even shocked, to learn that in all 50 states, men have no rights when it comes to protecting the life of their pre-born children. As members of the Cathedral Parish and through our own life experiences, Jennifer and I have come to appreciate now ever more deeply and prayerfully the importance of this year of St. Joseph. Wake up, it's quiz time. Who's the world's best father? Why, St. Joseph, of course. So in this year of St. Joseph, where do we go next? We find this insightful pronouncement from Pope Paul VI on March 19th, the Feast of St. Joseph, 1969. St. Joseph is the gospel Jesus watched for 30 years and then preached for three years. A highly respected scholar of St. Joseph, Mr. Ivan Priscilla, in his opus titled Joseph, the Messianic Father of Jesus, which was 70 years in the making, provides additional key insights as to why we should turn to Joseph at this moment in our church's and country's history. Mr. Priscilla points out that in our mind's eye, we can imagine the development and maturation of Jesus through his observation of the Jewish sacred tradition, his obedience to his parents, and his relationship with his earthly father during time at work, prayer, and recreation. We read in St. Luke's Gospel that under the watchful eyes of his parents, Jesus for his part, progressed steadily in wisdom and age and grace before God and men. It was from Joseph that Jesus would have learned the glorious Jewish history, the Psalms, with particular attention to the Psalms of David, and the prophecies of Isaiah, in particular those describing the suffering servant as well as how to chant the profession of faith, the Shema. St. Joseph taught his divine son the redemptive value in work and importance of patience, judgment, honesty, and persistence. Many theologians and saints refer to St. Joseph as the first among all the saints after Mary. St. Teresa of Avila, a doctor of the church, reminds us that other saints can help us just in a particular need, whereas St. Joseph can assist us in all of our needs. She states, just as Jesus was filially obedient to all Joseph's orders here on earth, so he obeys all his intercessory prayers in heaven. By the way, did I mention that our council sponsored a 33-day consecration to St. Joseph group, which used the recently published book by Father Donald Calloway? Perhaps you read about it in the December issue of Catholic Life, our diocesan magazine. All of the knights who completed this consecration were changed by it. Please watch for announcements in your La Crosse Parish bulletins for future consecration groups led by the Knights this Lent. WWJD, what would Joseph do to help us pray more fervently for a culture of life and to help us engage courageously in those activities which will bring an end to abortion and its associated culture of death. In these final minutes, I'd like to give you some thoughts about that. How about 
ite ad Yosef statem, or in simple English, go to Joseph stat, not tomorrow, or next week, or next month, but now. First, who was Joseph? You might say, oh, come on, Charlie. Everybody knows who Joseph was. He was the foster father of Jesus, husband of our blessed mother, and worked as a carpenter. What else is there to know? Besides, look at sacred scriptures. He doesn't complain or even say a single word in any of the four gospels. All right, ladies, wives, no comments, please. Now, granted, you might say that he received information in a dream to take Mary, his betrothed, the woman he was prepared to divorce quietly, who was pregnant through the Holy Spirit into his home as his wife, and then named the child Jesus. Now that's trusting in God. He traveled with his very pregnant wife, Mary, from Nazareth to Bethlehem for the census, and he was there at our Lord's birth. Now that's obedience to authority. In accordance with Jewish tradition, he either performed or witnessed our Lord's circumcision and named him Jesus. Now that's commitment to sacred tradition. He was in the temple for the presentation and heard Simeon's devastating and bone-chilling prophecy about the sword which would pierce the heart of Mary and that the child would be a sign that would be contradicted. Now this was just the beginning for Joseph to prepare and support both his wife and his son for these events, a mission to which he remained always faithful, or as the Marines would say, semper fi. He received timely instructions, again in a dream, to take the Christ child and his mother to Egypt to escape the murderous intentions of King Herod for the newborn king of the Jews, Jesus. Not tomorrow, not after his morning coffee, but now, O oh dark hundred. Go, get your wife and your son now. Pack and go. By the way, don't forget the gold that the Magi gave you. You're going to need it wherever you end up. Now that's what you call semper paratus, always being prepared and courageous. After Herod's death, he received the directive, once again in a dream, to return to the land of Israel. But along the way, he learned that Archelaus, the son of Herod, was ruling over Judea, and he was afraid to go back there. No surprise. But again, through a dream, he was directed to go to the region of Galilee, and he settled the Holy Family in Nazareth. Now that's what you call being prudent. He and our Blessed Mother frantically searched for Jesus for three days when he was 12 and was lost in the temple, his father's house. Can you imagine what was going through Joseph's and Mary's minds? Now that's what you call suffering sudden loss and shifting into crisis mode. We assume that he was in the Holy Family household for some period of time thereafter, working as a carpenter and likely teaching Jesus his craft and the value of labor. There is no further mention of him in sacred scripture. He was not at the wedding feast at Cana. He was not present during the public ministry of our Lord. He was not standing with his wife at the foot of the cross. However, as I said earlier, he had helped prepare them, and he was with them in spirit and prayer. So why should we go to Joseph, especially as it relates to this issue of abortion? Because St. Joseph clearly demonstrates all those attributes that we desire for all fathers unwavering faith and love of God, 
complete trust in his will, providing for his family, modeling with his wife for his offspring sacred beliefs and a code of conduct that instills virtue of enduring value. When should a father start demonstrating such behaviors on behalf of his son or daughter? At the beginning? Do you mean the beginning of preparation for baptism, holy communion, confirmation, leaving for college or getting married? No, from the true beginning, from the moment of conception. It means, first and foremost, recognizing the innate dignity of his lifelong partner, his wife, honoring his commitment to her, remembering that God created them, male and female, and that they be fruitful and multiply, respecting that the marital embrace is a sacred gift from God and the proper source of both biologic life and spiritual life. Accepting that it is not to be tampered with or thwarted by artificial means. For our almighty, loving, and all-powerful God alone is the author of life, not woman or man. To him alone as the Alpha, and Omega belong our beginnings and our going from this world into eternity. Man cannot take this upon himself. Not even a physician has the right to take this upon himself or herself. So men, we have a tall order but it's really the life of grace Christ has modeled for us and God has promised to supply us with all we need to be faithful. Saint Joseph will lead the way. So let us remember to ite ad Joseph statim, go to Joseph, for the courage to live out the noble calling to fatherhood or spiritual fatherhood, whatever God calls us to. The children of the world need us. Saint Joseph, model of fathers, respecter and protector of life itself in the incarnate word, pray for us. Thank you. Dr. Charlie. Well, I wanted to thank you publicly for the, your reflections and um, uh, thank everybody for hanging in there with us. Um, I hope that this, these thoughts will be with you. We'd like to welcome any questions, if there are any, from at least from the audience members here. Any questions? Well, in just wrapping this, um, the, the, the whole event up here, I just would leave with a two little short, short thoughts that in the, the modern day deficit we see today, that politicians may see things in terms of economy, but this isn't enough. It's a consideration, but we know that it ultimately lies in a spiritual deficit. And what we really need are gospel values that have been given to us by the God-man Jesus Christ. So what can we do? We may feel helpless, but every effort to live the truth is efficacious. And it's hard work to practice self-denial and patience and kindness and fortitude and courage. Anybody who's really tried this and with a, a sincere effort knows that it's not child's play. But this is the path to holiness, and really what we need, what's called for today, is that we all become saints. And even our high priest, Jesus Christ, was rejected, and he suffered. But we follow him, and we know that he is the victor. 
He wins, he always does, and we believe that. So be of light heart and courageous. Speak the truth. God is with us. He will prevail. And so we'll close with Monsignor's prayer. I was thinking, would you lead us in the Our Father? I just think that as the, I was praying about that today too, this morning, just waking up and thinking of this presentation of fathers, but there is one Father who is the Lord of all life in heaven and on earth. So we give thanks to the Almighty Father for giving us life and we hope to protect it. Very good, thank you so much. Uh, very inspiring, and I appreciated uh, both of your perspectives on life. And you stole my thunder by saying that you might kind of say, why bother? It's beyond us, the train has left the station. But everything we do is connecting to eternity and, and bears God glory and honor by our effort. God loves our struggle. So thank you for being a part of the struggle. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Lord be with you. And the Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace.